Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming on this on this gray June Tuesday. Uh, what better time uh, to uh, come together and uh, investigate history a little bit. I'm Anthony Flint. I'm fellow and director of public affairs here at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and it is my great pleasure to introduce today's lecture because today we'll be hearing about a very important man uh, in the story and the history of the Lincoln Institute, Henry George. And here's how the story goes. Just before the turn of the last century, an inventor and entrepreneur named John C. Lincoln, based in Cleveland, founded the Lincoln Electric Company with a capital investment of $200 uh, to make electric motors he had designed. The company went on to great things. Uh, Lincoln also famously invented a new welding process that was ultimately made portable and became instrumental in all manner of infrastructure and shipbuilding and construction and many other uses. John Lincoln thus became a very wealthy man, but he was no traditional industrialist and certainly no robber baron. With his brother James, he established progressive workplace policies that are studied to this day across the river at Harvard Business School. An employee advisory board, Lincoln Electric, uh, essentially a way of uh, a system for employee suggestions about how to run the company better. Full coverage for everyone under group life insurance, fair to say just about unheard of at the time. Training and a kind of continuing education school. Paid vacations, another first. And an employee stock ownership plan, yet another first in the nation. John C. Lincoln became interested in Henry George, whose influence had, of course, extended from New York to Cleveland and Ohio. He read Progress in Poverty and reflected on the themes of land, ownership, and taxation of his day. Perhaps because he was a man who made things, John C. Lincoln chafed at the idea that real estate speculators were collecting huge profits simply because they were often just lucky enough to have owned prime land. It was government action and public investment that created value for property owners, a windfall enjoyed by the wealthy elite who clearly did not share his principles related to equity and distribution. John Lincoln founded the Lincoln Foundation in 1946 and then the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy uh, began as a distinct organization fully funded by the foundation beginning in 1974. In 2006, the two organizations merged to form a single private operating foundation. And the idea all along was this, to explore the wild world of what we have come to call land policy, the use, regulation, and taxation of land including land economics, urban planning, and property rights. Today we believe land policy is underneath, if you will, so many of the challenges of the 21st century, from restoring municipal fiscal health in struggling cities such as Detroit to the issues of equity and sustainability in global urbanization. We study the land value tax and value capture as a tool for financing balanced urban development and infrastructure, and under the leadership of our new president, George McCarthy, we're placing new emphasis on the realities of implementation. And lo and behold, Henry George has bounced right back into the news recently with articles in The Economist and other publications heralding uh, some of these land-based financing ideas. Edward T. O'Donnell uh, is an associate professor of history at Holy Cross College in Worcester. He's written this terrific book uh, Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality, Progress and Poverty in the Gilded Age, just out by Columbia University Press. He's also author of Ship Ablaze, The Tragedy of the Steamboat General Slocum, and co-author of the U.S. History College level textbook, Visions of America, A History of the United States. His scholarly articles have appeared in the Public Historian, Journal of Urban History, and the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Though steeped in history, he has embraced all things digital, clearly, uh, creating video history courses, and my personal favorite, establishing a blog on American history, in the passlane.com. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Edward O'Donnell. 
Well, thank you very much. It's, it's really wonderful to be here at the Lincoln Institute and to get a chance to talk about Henry George to people who at least have some sense of who he was and um, some of the ways in which his ideas are still very vibrant in our, in our times. And the fact that my, my book, which uh, I will not bore you with the several decades long story of how long it took me to write this book, but uh, let's just say that life intervened at many, many different moments as it often does. And so the book kept getting put aside. And then if you've ever read the book and put it aside, you know, it, to, to get it back up and running again takes a long time. And then you put it aside. And so anyway, it finally has, uh, there were many times I doubted that it would appear, but uh, here it is and, and, uh, and off we go. And as always, Henry George is always relevant, but I, I think as Anthony said, it, he seems to be having yet another moment of, of relevance, or at least another moment in the, uh, in the public eye. And uh, hopefully that'll continue. So today, first couple of first things. One is, uh, I'm coming to you as a historian. So I know a lot of you are economists and people that understand numbers and uh, tax rates and things of that nature a lot, lot better um, than I do. In fact, my favorite, one of my favorite days of the year is when I walk to my accountant and hand him a huge stack of papers and say, would you please make this go away? And he says, yes, that'll be $400. And I said, that's awesome, great. <laughs> so even my own taxes, I, I hand off to, uh, to somebody else. But I think the one thing that, that uh, one of my goals today is to talk about uh, if we are sort of living in a second gilded age, which many, many people argue that we are, uh, the question is, why would that be important to know? Wh why is that reference point important? And so I'm going to take us back into the late 19th century to talk about what, what it was about the first gilded age that uh, got Henry George thinking um, and to explain where his, how he, this improbable story in a lot of ways, this guy with a seventh grade education, self-taught in economics, um, is, here we are in 2015 still, still talking about him. So let's get things going. Um, here's our, our, our operative question today, are we living in a second gilded age? I won't tell you yes or no, but I think you can it'll give us something to think about. And it's, tr it's unquestionable that many people are asking this question. You just look at some books that have come out, po Political Economy in the New Gilded Age, The New Gilded Age, a collection of essays by The New Yorker. Uh, who cares, and the final tagline there is, uh, From the New Deal to the Second Gilded Age. The Second Gilded Age, The New Gilded Age, just sort of interchangeable terms. Uh, and believe me, when people are using these terms, they're not writing happy uh, books and writing about um, how things are just great. They're saying, we, you know, we, we did this once before, and it was a a, a, an age that we struggled to get out of, and it became, not to speak too simplistically, the, we moved from that age to the, to the progressive era, uh, which John Lincoln, in so many ways, uh, embodied so many of the ideals and so many of the ideas and, and notions and, and things about what the progressive era was about. We'll get to that in a little bit. All right, so clearly, second Gilded Age, new Gilded Age. In fact, I have a Google News search for those two phrases, and uh, almost every day, uh, I get some kind of reference to one or two or three or four articles that are referencing this this phrase. Sometimes talking about an auction, you know, uh, where huge billion dollar billionaires are coming in and, and uh, dr driving the price of art up, or simply a, a commentary on on our current times. And uh, of course, uh, Thomas Piketty uh, really came into the uh, public parlance uh, the, in the last year. And this book, this 700, I think it's 700 pages, or maybe it just felt like it was 700 pages, uh, book, which I did get through, um, sold 500,000 copies. You know, in a way, you think go back to 1879, Henry George writes this 540 page book on economics, and it becomes the bestseller of its day, the best selling book on economics. And, you know, no one would have guessed it. And I think no one would have necessarily predicted the impact that this, uh, that this book has had. And there's a lot of very interesting parallels between the two the two books. Piketty is, has, you could say, is one of the people who has sort of helped jumpstart the conversation about inequality, not just in the United States, but also, also uh, uh, internationally. And uh, I didn't have to look very far in the book to find a, a, a quotation from Thomas Piketty that kind of evoked the same ideas, uh, almost word for word, what Henry George says, which is, if we allow inequality to continue and to get worse and worse and worse, it will destroy our democracy. And it's really one of the fundamental points that George uh, had to say, that we can't just wait for the market to correct it, can't just wait for something, you know, for things to get better. So let's start with uh, a simple question, who was Henry George? I won't go into massive detail about him, but it's important to know where he was, you know, who he was and where this, his, this, this as I said, fairly improbable story began. All right, uh, a brief bio on Henry George. 
There's a young George, probably about age 15. He was born in Philadelphia in 1839. He was born into a middle class family that was, you know, reasonably prosperous. His dad was a bookseller. So uh, a lot of, if you read some old biographies or some old accounts of him, they say George grew up in poverty. That's why poverty became his obsession. No, he, he grew up fairly comfortably, then plunged himself into poverty. And that's what uh, ultimately, you know, got him thinking about it. Um, he was a terrible student, so they say the long, if you write a biography, you sometimes start to identify with your subject, and that can be a perilous thing. Well, I, would, I see a lot of myself in Henry George, uh, one of which was uh, I was a smart kid, but I was just so distracted and so just not interested in finishing my homework. I'd rather build a model boat. And uh, he seems to have been kind of like that, uh, like that sort of a student. So his father eventually just gives up uh, and says, fine, you're not going to school anymore. You're age 14. Let's move on to something more practical and sends him off to get trained as a printer, which is r incredibly uh, fortuitous for George because when he writes his book, nobody wants to publish it because it's too radical, it's too, too uh, you know, and, and, and he has no reputation. So he says, okay, fine, plan B, uh, borrow money from my friends, and then I'm going, because I know how to set type, I can literally make the book myself. And so he, got a, he made an author's edition, got 500 copies printed, uh, based on money he borrowed from his friends, and sent these beautifully published copies to New York publishers, the very ones who rejected him, and they, uh, Appleton's, which was sort of one of the bigger publishers, accepted it because they, they knew they wouldn't have to invest nearly as much money in it. Uh, he heads for California, like a lot of people, uh, restless people on the make, um, heads out there and does all sorts of things, tries his hand at, you know, panning for gold, and um, he's a real, really ambitious guy, wants to make it big, but he struggles. He fails so many times. He's just the sort of the king of bad decisions. He's, things are going well and he decides, well, I'm going to put all my money in uh, investing in, in, in this and then it, the, the enterprise goes under or he gets in a fight with his boss and gets fired. Uh, and he really struggles. He lives, he's homeless for quite a while. He's living in, you know, barns. Um, you know, at one point says, I even thought about killing myself, you know, so he's, and there's a lot of people. This is the, you know, the, a, a fairly tumultuous time economically and he's really um, bearing the brunt of it. He finally gets his way into journalism. Again, printing. Being a printer gets him in the door. And so he starts setting type and that'll feed yourself and, and you'll do reasonably well as a, as a journeyman printer. But if you show some ambition and some talent, you can get, get yourself into the, into the editorial room. And, and that's exactly what he did. So uh, by the 1860s, 1870s, he's, he's editing newspapers and establishing a bit of a reputation for himself. He gets married and uh, continues to struggle. His newspaper's going great, and then it goes under. His newspaper's going great, and he gets fired. He's, he, uh, his newspaper's going great, so they open a second uh, edition of it, you know, morning edition, and it, it goes under. So he's either through being a little bit overly ambitious or just being incredibly unlucky. Henry George continues to struggle. And I'm just going to show you one example. And this really does shape his view on he knows poverty very deeply, not from his upbringing, but from his young adulthood. On Christmas Eve, he wrote in his diary uh, the following passage, determined to cultivate habits of determination, energy, and industry, feel that I am in a bad situation and must use my utmost effort to keep afloat and go ahead. And so this is traditional stuff. It's Christmas Eve. It's almost New Year's Eve. He's always making resolutions. But in this, you see, he's so classically mid-19th century American, right? All I need to do is get my act together, work hard, stay, you know, focus on what I need to do. It's all my fault, essentially. I'm failing largely because I keep messing up. I keep, it's, it's, I'm not, I don't have it, that stick to itiveness, that, that self-made man, the ingredients of the self-made man, which everybody is so enthralled with. Um, and then the final line of that entry, saw a landlady and told her I was not able to pay the rent. And this is a guy with a young child and a second child on the way. So he is really despondent about his, about his situation. So that's one key influence. Another is that George is really shaped by the period in which all this is happening. It's an incredibly tumultuous uh, period in American history, and I'll give you some idea of that in a, in a few moments. Um, well, you can't really see that the, the, the slide somehow is a little bit cut off there, but it's, it says optimism versus anxiety. The duality of the Gilded Age. There's never been a more era, an era where there was more uh, wealth produced, more incredible earth-shattering in innovations, technologically speaking. Uh, and just incredible enthusiasm for what was happening and a period in which there was more turmoil and more poverty and more hand-wringing about the direction in which the country was going. And George, of course, is going to take that duality and turn it into his own 
really powerful uh, couplet, uh, progress and poverty. We want the progress, but we seem to be stuck with poverty. In fact, more poverty, how can we get out of that? But we're, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay, so let's just take an example of the kind of attitude, this optim let's look at the optimistic side first, right? So here's uh, President Cleveland giving his inaugural address in 1893, and you can see from this, from this quotation, he, it's all about progress. Every American citizen must contemplate with the utmost pride and enthusiasm our growth and expansion of our country, the wonderful thrift and enterprise of our people, and the demonstrated superiority of our free government, right? Free enterprise, free government, everything's going great. Of course, if you know your economic history, that's March of 1893, and just a couple weeks later, the economy goes into the Great Depression of the 1890s. So uh, it's a very, very uh, tumultuous time, despite the optimism expressed by President Cleveland. And there's a lot to be optimistic about. There's, they're not making this up. Just look, and I won't bury you in statistics, but just take a look at the, the far right-hand column here in terms of output. You know, f hundreds of, of, of factories, th thousands, millions of industrial workers, um, oil production, 9,000% increase in this 40-year period. Steel production, almost 10,000% increase. Steel was a, practically a boutique item, you know, made in small batches for medical instruments in the 1860s, and, that, and then it becomes the substance of the great, you know, the great transformative substance of the late 19th century. In fact, I, I often in, in other settings will compare steel of the Gilded Age to the silicon chip of, our, of, of, the, of the last 50 years. Really, the, they said, what's the one thing that has changed everything? That they, they both qualify on that, on that front. All right, and it's also a time of celebration. There are these moments in American history in this last third where we have these grand national celebrations for really epic-making kinds of discoveries or, or, or achievements. One is laying a cable across the Atlantic Ocean connecting New York to London. It may not seem like a big deal to to us now, but that's up there with launching a satellite. You know, the first, cel first successful telecommunication satellite. It really begins the shrinking uh, of the world. Um, in just a couple of years later, the United States continent is spanned by the Transcontinental Railroad. This had touches off celebrations all across America. People are gathered in public squares waiting for the word that the continent, you know, that the golden spike has been driven to, to knit the, uh, the country together coast to coast. So it, it may not, we think of railroad you know, locomotives as these sort of quaint old fashioned things. They were the super colliders, the, you know, the space shuttles of their day. They were, they were the, the emblem of the era. And national, we had great uh, World's Fairs, Philadelphia in 1876, and then there were several smaller ones, but the other big one in Chicago uh, in 1893. And if you know anything about uh, these, these World's Fairs, the number one thing they're all about is, is technology. Th that's the showcase piece. It, there's culture, there's this, there's that, there's entertainment, but the fundamental point is to showcase machinery, showcase new technology. Um, and we see this well into the 20th century. Um, I don't know if any of you made it, were, made it through the 1964 New, New York World's Fair, but uh, it was all about technology in those days. Uh, and then the Brooklyn Bridge opening, and this is just a sampling of the things. In 1883, again, if you see the Brooklyn Bridge today, it looks like this quaint, beautiful, you know, old piece of architecture, right? It has those beautiful stone archways and things. But at the time, it was hailed as the technological marvel of the day. In fact, the great embodiment of what steel could do. You know, if you think about in the, up until this moment in history, when you thought about, when, when people thought about what was strength, what was architectural strength was mass, you know, pyramids, cathedrals, thickness, and so forth. And steel says, comes along and you say, no, it's actually open space. You know, look at it, it's like a great big harp. And uh, the president turned out, millions of people turned out, it was a, a huge gala affair. So there's a lot to celebrate. Now, of course, there is poverty in the late 19th century. Even wealthy, successful people can't <coughs> get past that fact. So they had to address it, at least in some regard. And here are two sort of you know, representative responses. Um, one was to simply condemn the poor for, for being poor. So here's a quotation actually from a book written by Henry George. He's the guy that quotes this guy. Um, there is a large class, I was about to say, majority of the population of New York and Brooklyn to whom the rearing of two or more children inevitably means a boy for the penitentiary and a girl for the brothel. Boom, right? Very blunt, not a whole lot of uh, uh, sympathy there, just saying the poor are minting more poor and that's the problem. Um, really not concerned with why they're poor, what are the structures of the economy or the society that, that lead to so many people being poor. And then if you want to take that up a notch, you can go in the, in the full-on direction of social Darwinism, which is becoming I incredibly popular in this, in this era as a way to sort of explain why things are, and in many ways to explain away why things are. And so in this case, you can see a rather harsh view saying basically, let the drunkards die in the ditch, let the 
people that don't have self-discipline die of gluttony and so forth, especially because it means they won't mint any more children uh, of that sort. And now, where does this quotation come from, you know, where it says, what benevolence to let the lawless perish and the prudent survive? This comes from the Christian advocate. Right? This is, main, to a degree, mainstream thinking. Not saying everybody believed this, but this was not a controversial thing to say in the nation's largest selling religious uh, publication in this time period. All right, so we've got the optimism part pretty well established. There's a lot of fist pumping and, and uh, excitement in the Gilded Age, but there's also, as I say, correspondingly, a lot of anxiety um, and a lot of evidence that poverty, especially, is this growing, festering problem. And uh, just, I, you, you can, people begin to literally see poverty more, more evidently, not only when they walk through American cities, but also in the publications that they get. So this is a Harper's Weekly publication, and I will often show this in public settings in, in, in different circumstances and say, what, do you, what book do you think this came from? And in inevitably, somebody says, Charles Dickens. And that's exactly, that's not just a coincidence that you think it's a Charles Dickens thing. There's a lot of meaning there. Because if you asked Ameri if you look at 19th century American culture, culture is all, you know, identity, whether it's an individual's identity or a nation's identity, is always wrapped up in what you think you are, how you identify yourself. I am this, I'm this, I'm that. And also there's the other side of the coin, which is and I'm definitely not this or that. And in the 19th century, Americans understood themselves to be freedom-loving, capitalistic, uh, uh, people, citizens of a democracy. And the opposite of that was Europe. We are not European. I mean, we're all ethnically European, or a large percentage of us are. But we are not people who believe in kings and queens, landed estates, arist aristocracy, fixed uh, classes, and established churches, and perpetual warfare, and, and so. And so when Americans see in their number one publication in the 1870s a scene like this from New York City, where a family huddles around a steam grate, and a wealthy family walks by, and it looks like you know a scene from one of, one of Dickens' novels, it, it is part of that anxious question that's there. Are we becoming European? Are we sliding back? To, we broke away in the late 18th century. We've established this great republic. And think about this too, if you know anything about 19th century rhetoric, it's cons very consistent to not just say we live in a republic. Lincoln and, and uh, Jefferson and everybody would always constantly say, we are part of a republican experiment. Right? It's, un it's ongoing, it's unfolding, and it might actually collapse if we're not careful. So this is the idea that maybe the experiment is actually going, uh, going awry. Um, and Walt Whitman, who'd been around a long time, and there's no more optimistic American in the mid-19th century who sings the song of America and, and so forth. Whitman, one of his last public uh, lectures, said, we are in serious trouble here. If the United States, like the countries of the old world, there's your reference, that's what we aren't, uh, are also to grow vast crops of poor, just desperate, dissatisfied, nomadic, miserably waged populations, then our Republican experiment, notwithstanding all its surface successes, and I put that in blue because that's the, uh, the, the, the metaphor of gilded age, right? The, a, gilded, a gilded bracelet is not solid gold. It might look like solid gold, but below the surface is something far cheaper, far meaner. Uh, is at heart an unhealthy failure? And this is just a representative quotation from this, the, rep, of this anxiety. In fact, you could kind of pair this with that uh, Grover Cleveland uh, quotation earlier. So what are people anxious about? Well, let's just go through a couple of things uh, in succession. One is the rise of big business, um, the, and business that is bigger than anyone could have ever imagined. Uh, and it's, I, I could show you lots of wonderful, colorful Puck Magazine cartoons. I'll just show you two. This one is, in some ways, uh, well, I, I would hesitate to say the most representative one, but it really gets at a bunch of things. It's called The Bosses of the Senate. And so it's not just, as I say to my students, it's not that just that Carnegie and Rockefeller were, as we say in Eastern Massachusetts, wicked rich. It's just that they are so powerful. With that money, with that wealth comes power. And so you see the industrialists of the age, the great corporate trusts, shaped like money bags, looking very severe and, and dangerous, coming in, and if you look at the details in the upper right-hand corner, entrance for monopolists. So there's a big wide door in the Congress. This will shock you people. Over 100 years ago, corporations had huge control and influence in Congress. Thankfully, we've, we've gotten past that. Um, <laughs> but seriously, if you look in the, in the far left, there's a little doorway. And above that doorway, it says people's entrance. And the doorway is boarded shut. And the representatives of the democracy, these little people in the foreground, they are 
senators, and they are cowering or looking very anxious while these massive, powerful corporations, these unelected, unreachable from a democratic standpoint, uh, corporations are lording their power over. So where's the real power in the land? It's not in the people. It's in uh, it's in the in the in the trust. And by the way, this is not the Knights of Labor Weekly or the Socialist um, Standard. This is the Puck Magazine. This is the middle class, upper class mainstream magazine that people were reading. So it's a shared anxiety. It's not just poor people who are uh, upset about their fortunes. It's, there's a lot of shared anxiety across classes. And here's another one um, that I love to show in class. You know, you've got your, you know, it's, it's the tournament of today, a, a set two between labor and monopoly. And again, a Puck Magazine uh, publication. And you see monopoly, notice the symbolism, right? It's the locomotive, the, the monopoly is the locomotive, but it's also, it's a locomotive that is uh, shrouded in images of, medieval, of a medieval knight, right? Where do medieval knights come from? Uh, from Europe, right? And who do they represent? Kings and queens and aristocrats. So, and it's, and he's, it's of course, the metal is all gold. And there's a lot of detail which uh, I highly recommend if you, and I, I'm happy to share this image with you, uh, where there's a lot of uh, important details that kind of flesh out this uh, the, the larger problem. The men on the far left are all very recognizable faces. You would know them all if you read this, uh, picked up this magazine in 1890. There's Vanderbilt, there's Gould, there's a whole bunch of Wall Street titans. And they look big and they look thrilled. They've got really gleeful faces. And notice us, right? The laborer sitting on that little scrawny horse. Um, the horse is labeled, labeled poverty. Uh, the only weapon that that laborer has is a, a mallet labeled strike. Meaning, why do we have so many strikes? It's because it's the only way that labor gets attention. It's not that the labor is you know, reflexively um, you know, uh, radical and so forth. And then if you look at the people, look at the people in the background there hanging on the fence. They're skinny, they're gaunt, they look very, very sort of beaten down, almost like European peasantry. So there's a lot of anxiety about this kind of emergence of classes. And, and in fact, remember that uh, we still use these phrases today, but in the 19th century, it was very, very widely accepted that we are not a society of classes. We don't have classes. Or if we do have classes, they're very fluid, and you move through them as quickly as you, as you can. And you can fall down you, into a lower class, you can rise into another one. All right, so one thing, rise of big business. Another is rise of great fortunes in the hands of, uh, of individuals. And we could go on uh, talking about this at great length, but let's just look at a couple of statistics. Um, by 1890, the 1%, so this is where the, the language of the 1% begins to emerge for the first time. They own 51% of all wealth in the United States. And another, another way to slice that same pie chart is to say the lower 44% of the population, so almost half of Americans, own barely 1.2% uh, of, of wealth. So it's an incredible disparity of, uh, of wealth. And a lot of it has been accelerated in the, in the last 30 years or so. And also the visibility. We won't go into this, but... It, who, what are the symbols of this Gilded Age? It's people building palaces on Fifth Avenue and even bigger palaces at Newport, uh, Rhode Island and having giant you know, uh, balls and soirees and affairs that are you know, d discussed in great detail in the paper about how many millions of dollars Mrs. Vanderbilt's dinner cost and so forth. So there's a lot of, and what does that remind us of? It's very unrepublican behavior. It's never been tolerated in the United States until the 1870s. And then suddenly the nouveau riche say, if we've got it, we're going to flaunt it, right? The old Republican way of dealing with wealth was to, you know, live comfortably but modestly. Don't Republican simplicity was very important. It was European to hire, a, make your servants dress in uniforms. It is absolutely un-American thing to do until this t this time period. And if you want to, by way of comparison, 2010. Those that were the latest stats I have. Uh, the one percent uh, share of wealth has begun to rise since the 70s, and it's up to 34 percent. It's probably up higher than that now since five years of uh, transpired and the trends have, have only, uh, at least to some degree, accelerated. So that's the second thing, rise of a big business, rise of uh, colossal fortunes in the hands of a few, and they, they behave badly as European aristocrats. And then thirdly, labor capital conflict. Uh, this is in some ways the scariest uh, prospect. Here's a scene from the Haymarket incident, the Haymarket bombing of 1886, which triggered the first Red Scare. We often think McCarthy is the Red Scare. Well, actually, there was two, two Red Scares before that, uh, and this is in the late 1880s. And just look at some of these numbers here. Between 1881 and 1900, so just 20 years, 37,000 strikes. There probably are not more than 3,000 strikes in all of American history up to that point. And then, boom, they are happening everywhere and anywhere. Some of them, in fact, some of the biggest, three of the top 10 strikes in American history appear, occur in this 
this uh, last third of the century. Big strikes in the 1877 railroad strike, just for one example, 100 workers are killed. And it's all across the country because it's a railroad strike. It's the first national strike. So these are alarming developments and they remind Americans say, wait a minute, Europe's the place where we have, that has this, you know, these angry masses who occasionally explode. And of course the Paris Commune had taken place only a, a decade or so earlier. So people had a viv vivid image in their mind of a Euro how European society operates. And again, we seem to be uh, exemplifying that. And we could, we could take this even further, but I'll just point out that one way you see things happening in a time period is look at what, what's established. Labor Day, uh, which we sort of take for granted and we actually generally practice Labor Day in America as non-Labor Day, uh, meaning, you know, go to the beach and hang out and, and there's virtue in that, but Labor Day was born out of this troubled time period. In 1882, workers in New York City, and this is the first parade, first Labor Day parade and then a day of uh, picnicking uh, took place. And that tells you that in 1882, workers felt so besieged so unheeded, so unpaid attention to, that they felt they needed to create a holiday that the single purpose was to say, hey Americans, all your wealth comes from us. If we're hurting, you're, you know, the, the, the republic is in danger. And there, there's actually great close-ups of the signs that they're carrying. Labor creates all wealth, you know, uh, uh, and so forth. All right, Labor Day, that's September 5th, 1882. So, in this context of uh, extreme or uh, enthusiastic optimism and great anxiety emerges Henry George. And he, he fixates on this dual, dual quality of industrialization. He says it has produced just incalculable uh, treasures. And in fact, in the early part of Progress and Poverty, he says, imagine if you could time travel Ben Franklin, or at least tell Ben Franklin, about what's going to happen in the next hundred years. That there'll be things called railroads. And you know, he said ben, ben Franklin would, have, would assume that this would mean a golden age, an age where everybody, with all this wealth and technology, everything's going great, when in fact all those things have happened, but distribution has been greatly unequal and there's a lot of suffering, a lot of, a lot of distress. And he's eventually going to put the label on that. He, the original title for it is, he had several very clunky, wonky uh, titles to the book and somehow it, just at the last moment he came up with this idea of a good title and then a wonky subtitle. You know, subtitle is like three sentences long. And so Henry George uh, publishes this book in 1879. It doesn't garner too much attention. So he moves to New York City, knowing that that's, a, you know, that's where things happen. That's where you get attention. That's where you get lectures. That's where the newspapers are. That's where the, the thinkers are. It's also where it's the touch point for Europe. So where he, he's hoping to bring some of these ideas about land and taxation and e inequality uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. So he moved to New York City. It's a very bold move. In fact, it's the one bold move in his life, uh, in a se after a series of, I guess the t first bold move was to write his book th that paid off, but the second one, to go to New York City, he didn't really know anybody and it turned out to be just a brilliant move in terms of getting the book out there and becoming, this is what makes him a household name and a person still spoken about in 2015. Many of you are familiar with Henry George and, and the book. The book is sort of part a, an essay, a long essay, about what's wrong and why we should care about it. And, and it's beautiful. It's written in very, very fluid prose. It cites the Bible. It cites Jefferson. It's very, very readable. So people often say, why were, you know, cigar workers reading an economics textbook? Well, they're, they're probably flipping past the rent theory and, uh, you know, things of that nature and, and, and really focusing on the way he's sort of making, explaining how things, what, what's happening and why it's, you know, and putting it in historical context. He says, this is what happened in Rome. This is what happened, you know, and all great societies eventually reach this tipping point, he doesn't use that phrase, where uh, all the abundance and all starts to be siphoned off by a few, and then this society plunges into, into ultimately into anarchy and chaos and, and decline. And it, this is one of his great evocative phrases. What's happening in our country, right? So much progress and so much poverty, it's as though an immense wedge, a chisel, were being forced not underneath society, but through society, those who are above the point of separation are elevated, but those who are below are crushed down. So he said, we want a, a, you know, a wedge, but we want the wedge pushing everybody up. And instead it's going right down the middle, or maybe not even right down the middle, and it's crushing those below and elevating a, a, a select few uh, above. It's not the kind of world we want to live in. And uh, George also focused on uh, this, this, like what are the results of this problem of inequality? Um, and he says, you know, that the tendency towards inequality is evident, it's all around us, and it can't go much further. He's a very apocalyptic writer, saying, we've got to move now. We can't, 
uh, wait 20, 30, 40, 50 years. This is, we're going to reach, a, again, kind of a tipping point where he says, our civilization cannot go much further without carrying, or this situation cannot go much further without carrying our civilization into that downward path, which is so easy to enter and so hard to abandon. And then he says things that really do sort of speak to us in some ways today. Though knowledge yet increases and invention marches on. I mean, think about what's happened in the last 30 years. You know, uh, smartphones and the internet and you know, electric cars and uh, space shuttle and, and so forth. Uh, although these things are happening and cities still expand, civilization begun, has begun to wane when, in proportion to population, we must build more and more prisons. We must build uh, and more and more almshouses and more and more insane asylums. He's saying these are the signs of the times, signs of an unhealthy society if this is where we're heading. And it's unsustainable. All right. So the problem in, its, in, its, in a nutshell is that s someone, monopolizers, people are scheming and finding ways to grasp hold of, a, of a, a monopoly share of land and resources. And they're doing so to enrich themselves to, you know, to, by, by means of speculation. And as noted uh, in the introduction, um, not to uh, uh, produce anything necessarily, but just to sort of gain the system. This idea that if they latch onto pieces of land, shutting out those who would be productive users of it, and then can flip it and make, and make money. Uh, and so this is, leads to destructive inequality. If the average American worker in 1880 can no longer afford to start his own business, can no longer afford to buy a farm, can no longer afford to do the things that traditional American workers have done, this is going to, and, and therefore has to take you know, very grinding low wage work in a, in maybe even, uh, and sometimes being unemployed or underemployed, this is going to destroy uh, not equality, right? George is not a socialist, but, but a healthy or a modest level of inequality and inequality or a modest level of inequality that is paired with lots of opportunity. So it's sort of an opportunity society. Uh, so his solution um, is to break with laissez-faire, which had been the dominant notion of that, because uh, people were asking the same question, what should we do about it? And the, the, the chorus from Wall Street and from many places was, nothing, don't touch anything, it's going great. And another a great phrase you see a lot in political cartoons and in speeches is, don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg, right? You might think it a good idea to mess with the economy and to you know, tinker with the tax code and maybe enshrine the eight hour day and things like this, but that, will, that is all it's gonna take and that'll destroy everything. The whole capitalist system will collapse. And Re George says, that's ridiculous. Um, Laissez-faire made sense in the days of the Founding Fathers. Jefferson was right. The government that governs least governs best. And they were right to fear centralized government power. But in 100 years, something they could never conceive of has happened, which is that a, a center of power far more powerful than the most tyrannical government they could have ever imagined has emerged, and it's not within the reach of the people. And these are large uh, corporations and, and monopolies. And so his idea is this, this thing called the single tax. Never fully, completely explained. It's, it's a kind of a typical panacea. It's sort of, to, the, to, the, to George and to others, it was sort of self-evident. And he kind of left it to others to kind of explain how it would work. And that's why today, you know, places like the Lincoln Institute and others are, are, are spend a lot of time and a lot of resources and a lot of research in sort of interpreting it for our times. How could, if not outright the single tax, something like it, something that's based on its principles, work for us uh, in this modern, uh, this modern era? So progress and poverty to, you know, no one would have put bet on this. And in fact, Henry George publishes the book and sends a copy to his father. And his father, you know, for all you can tell, had a nice relationship with his father. But his father, in his private thoughts, must have said, this guy, I've got a son who just cannot win. He's just not, a, I wouldn't say he's a loser, but he's a guy who's just always falling on his face and always borrowing money and always, you know, just making the wrong move. And so, but despite that, Henry George writes a letter to his father and says, here's a copy of the book. It will go on, this is going to go on to be a great book. It'll be, it'll influence the world. It'll be translated into many, many languages. I mean, it is incredible optimism based on on nothing but it's great because it he he has a he's a real he, he sees himself in very much a prophet mode a prophet uh, in the biblical sense that he's got a message to tell and to him he knows he's right and he knows it's going to get gets get traction and get popularity and lo and behold he's right um, and he the george to his own surprise finds that the first big audience 
are working class Americans, not middle class thinkers, but uh, working class uh, producers. They, they become the ones who really attach to, the, to either the book itself or they put out a cheap working men's edition, kind of an early paperback version. It's also serialized in magazines and in newspapers and uh, people pass it around. And there are many, many accounts of workers like uh, Samuel Gompers, who, will, who goes on to found the American Federation of Labor uh, in the late 1880s, he's, he was a cigar maker. And he said, oh yes, uh, the tradition among the cigar makers was uh, while, all of, while all of us, except for, well, we would all work away making cigars, and then we'd choose one from our number to read. And he might read the New York Times to us, he might read some poetry to us, but the most popular literature requested by the cigar makers in the early 1880s was passages of progress and poverty, because it spoke to them. And again, probably not the rent stuff, but the, but the prosaic under, you know, interpretation of, of the times. Uh, and so why did he appeal to workers? Well, if you look at the traditional view of poverty, poverty we already saw a couple of examples of it, um, but workers were specifically told, you know, poverty just, it's terrible, but it's like, it's like bad weather. It's just inevitable, you can't stop it. And if you are poor, you can struggle to get out of it, but largely you need to endure it with an eye towards salvation and heaven where things are going to be just that much. Uh, you, your reward, if, if you spend 42 lousy years on earth, you're going to have eternity in heaven and things are going to be great. Well, this other, this worker, uh, Atkinson, who was a big Henry George uh, activist, puts, sets that up and then says, progress and poverty reversed all this, meaning reversed this kind of traditional notion of just endure it, the poor you will have always with us. Uh, and it taught that poverty is an artificial condition of man's invention. Working men and women learning all this commenced to wrestle with their chains. So this book was an eye-opener for lots and lots of people who said, yeah. And think about what I, how I described Henry George in the 1870s. He's chastising himself for his failures. And at a certain point he says, not that he absolves himself, but he says, you know, some of this is happening because of larger forces. There are, there are powerful forces at work that are making ambitious, hardworking people like me fall on our face and, and, and fail to succeed. So compressing this story a little bit, by, the 18, by 1886, this, and I go into great detail on this in the book, it's a, one of the years in American history, one of the great tumultuous years. You could list them, you know, maybe let's say 1776, uh, 1861, 1886, um, 1919, 1946, 1968, these are years of explosive social upheaval in American history. And uh, so, uh, and it's a big crackdown on, on labor, because uh, labor's been getting very powerful and very, very uh, successful in the 1880s. And so labor parties form all across the country. But the one that everybody pays attention to, of course, is in New York City, the United Labor Party. They know that they've got to pick a person that can win, They've run symbolic labor candidates that have gotten 500 votes and have caused all kinds of internal dissension. So they choose George because he's kind of the perfect package. He's a middle class guy, he's an intellectual, but he holds a Knights of Labor union card. He's, you know, they know that he struggled as a, as a young man, so his, his kind of biography is out there. Um, and he seems to be the right guy. And they nominate him, and uh, he plays a little hard to get, but it, all that works in his favor, and uh, this gets tremendous national and ultimately international co uh, coverage. Karl Marx is writing to people about it saying, what's going on in America? Who's this guy Henry George? I mean, it's really getting um, a, a lot of attention. His uh, opponents in the election are Abram Hewitt, who was a, a to, in his own way, kind of an early progressive uh, industrialist uh, and a congressman. And uh, this guy, Theodore Roosevelt, who was uh, not as well known as we would imagine. He was, he was an up and comer at this point. And, uh, the, and so th these are the two established party candidates. George knows he's got no money, he has no experience. Uh, none of the people on his campaign have any experience either, but they, they throw out the rule book. And you can see from this one image, George does what's never been done before. Um, runs a, a populist candidacy where he's out on the streets all night long, every night leading up to election. Stopping at as many as 20 places. And they call this the tailboard campaign because he's on the back of a wagon giving his speeches to the masses. And there's tremendous growing enthusiasm. And as I detail in the book, it's clear P Tammany Hall, which is the one backing Abram Hewitt, uh, the Democratic candidate is panicked because they realize, you know, the, those are hit, those are their voters. The, the poor working class people are being drawn into this new third party, the United Labor Party, and they pull out the stops to kind of stymie that. On election day, George stuns certainly New York City, arguably the nation, and certain people around the world are stunned. He doesn't win, but he comes comes close. Uh, and if you look, you know, he beats Theodore Roosevelt, 
And the two com combined votes between George and Roosevelt, they were the two progressive uh, candidates, certainly compared to, to Hewitt. Uh, so clearly something was happening. And a lot of people walked out of that election, including George, saying, this is, this is not a defeat. This is a sort of a defeat, but it's the stepping stone to something uh, much greater. In fact, he compares it to, to Bunker Hill. Next year, we're going to form a National Labor Party, and then we're going to have, you know, this is going to be the first of a, of a glorious People's Party. And he's sort of anticipating what, what it ultimately is formed, unconnected to him directly, uh, the progressives and the, and the People's Party. So, but it all falls apart, <laughs> as these stories often do. Uh, there's infighting, there's, there's dissension, there's, it's a big coalition of socialists and middle class reformers. And I go into detail about how it and why it all uh, seems to collapse. George runs for Secretary of State of New York the next year, which everybody thinks is this is it's the only important election, you know, office that's up for election in, the, uh, in New York State. Uh, and he gets a fraction of the votes that he got in just New York City. So it's, things have really, really fallen apart. But that's not the end of the George story. George himself will continue to write. He'll still have a big following. And the, but, but more and more after 1886, 1887, people that were influenced by him begin to you know, pick up the, his ideas, pick up, if not his direct ideas, his, the essence of his ideas and the essence of his call to action to save the American experiment, the American uh, Republican um, experiment. And George dies uh, 10 years later in 1897. Um, but by that point, there's a, there are legions of George uh, followers, uh, including um, Mr. Lincoln, who uh, by then had, had begun to read Progress and Poverty and see in it even, you know, t almost 30 years after, or tw almost 20 years after the book was originally published, uh, some ideas and things that really called out to him and, and really kind of changed his life. Uh, and, you know, the uh, Progress and Poverty will continue to be reissued. I, I had the, my father, when he found out that I was writing about Henry George, said, you know, I think your grandfather read Progress and Poverty in the 1930s. And eventually dug out the book. Now, my grandfather had a, a fifth grade education, came from Ireland, but was a real classic, like, self-taught guy. And so the Schalkenbach Foundation, which is one of the many George foundations, issued a new edition of Progress and Poverty in the midst of the Great Depression, no coincidence. And my, my grandfather bought it and read it. There's little notations in the, in the margin. It's a very, uh, I, I took that as a, as a good sign. But uh, since that time, George uh, has, has come in, and, I wouldn't say in and out of favor, but his, he's, you could track him in some ways over the decades, how often he's referenced in magazine articles and newspaper articles and, and books and so forth. And there definitely seems to be an uptick. I, I always say, and I have no evidence to prove this, but I've, read, I've written a U.S. history textbook, so I've read a lot of U.S. history textbooks. And if you go back into the 70s, you know, George might get a sentence. And now George seems to be getting a, you know, half a paragraph. Uh, he certainly does in my book. And I think that that's a, you know, kind of an interesting way of measuring uh, the, not only the way history has evolved and the way we tell our stories and things, but also where people are recognizing he wasn't you know, this, this godlike figure, but this, his, the way he was able to kind of fix, it, fix on the true problem of the day and to get people to think about it and how that influence carried forward into the progressive era is certainly uh, worth noting. And so George, what, if we are living in a second Gilded Age, uh, what does George have to talk, you know, speak to us about uh, today? Well, I just isolate a couple of things here. One is the way he describes the problem of inequality, as I noted at the beginning, is almost identical. In, in terms of basic terms that Thomas Piketty and other, you know, Stieglitz and others have pointed out that inequality is something that will not self-correct, particularly in the modern era. It's something that will pull us down and, and cause widespread suffering and widespread social disruption. Um, and one of my favorite points about Henry George, especially in this day, these days of, uh, you know, uh, popularity of libertarianism and, and uh, Ayn Rand books uh, selling, uh, you know, in, in, huge, in huge copies. We, we forget that, there's a, there, that individualism is not the only American ideal, right? That, that individualism has always coexisted uneasily and in competition with notions of the common good. The founding fathers believed in the common good, right? You know, the Constitution says, right in the very beginning, says, you know, to promote the general welfare. There's a lot of things in our Republican heritage, back to the founders, that talks about we have to attend to the common good. Uh, and so these things need to be in, in, in somehow in balance. Uh, and by the Gilded Age, it was all individualism, it was all laissez-faire, it was all what you individually could do and private property, absolute rights to private property were the, were the dominant notion. And George is very evocatively points out in this book and in, in his whole career 
that uh, we are made, f you know, that we need to be attentive to the common good, the things that hold us together. The fact that, sure, pu let's say public schools, for example. Public schooling is not in the Constitution. But at some point in American history, somebody said, you know, it would be a really good idea to have free public education for everybody. Uh, it'll cost us a little bit of money. It'll cost us a little bit of liberty and a little bit of, you know, f individual f individualism and so forth. But everybody's going to benefit from an educated, literate, civilized, you know, uh, populace. So that's why we, we've done that. So that notion of the common good, I think, is a lost virtue. And uh, I think one that we really need to be reminded about uh, in this day of kind of rampant celebration of, uh, of, of individualism. Um, and right on the heels of that, wh how do we solve our problems? Again, that libertarian notion is problems solve themselves. And uh, the government is the problem. The government can only do wrong. The government, and I'm not saying you know, government does everything right, but Henry George said, look, the government is us. And in a democracy, we can decide if we want public schools, if we want taxation to be, to take this particular form, if we want public parks, if we want uh, uh, to improve public health and so forth, we can decide as a democracy. And when the only way that happens is through the instruments of government on some level, uh, if only to build infrastructure and to do, and do those things. Uh, and the market itself, as wondrous as it is, is in some ways a myth, this idea that the market is this thing that just does things um, apart from the actions of state and local and uh, federal government. Uh, but it, the, the, the government does play a role. Because of the focus of your place, it's what really worth pointing out, being here at the Lincoln Institute, that why land value taxation uh, still has merit. Uh, something that I think is probably the average person doesn't think about property taxes and things other than uh, they see them connected to public schools. And that's really where the, in a lot of ways where the controversy seems to arise in the public square. But uh, how we tax ourselves, um, <laughs> I guess at this point, we seem to be arguing about if we tax ourselves. Uh, but how we tax ourselves is an ex exceedingly important thing um, as we move, move into, the, uh, into the 21st century and try to tackle uh, some of these problems. So I'm going to uh, say uh, thank you very much for listening and turn things over to, to questions if you, if you have any. consolidation of the city of New York and if, if you have do you see that as a, uh, a, a response to George's ideas or as a reaction to it? That's a good question. The consolidation of New York is a story you just couldn't imagine happening you know to, in a long, to make long and the short of it in the 1890s business leaders, real estate le investors, and, and, and Wall some Wall Street people, and some you know, progressive visionaries say, this is ridiculous. We've got all these different laws and codes for this, particularly around the harbor of New York, the busiest harbor in the world. And they say, Let, look, let's, we should dissolve all these local governments and create the great city of New York, the uh, consolidated city. And so New York City was already huge in 1897, but at uh, the stroke of midnight uh, on January 1st, 1898, the city, 40 local governments dissolved into one. And so the argument behind it, a lot of it was that this is going to facilitate, for example, building a subway system. We can't, we could, it's going to make things much more, um, much more likely that these things get. We, we, we can also establish universal codes and, and laws and rules and taxes uh, for the waterfront area instead of having all these different domains and, and municipalities I creating uh, chaos. And to a degree, it's all driven by the fact that how do you sell this idea to a uh, Astoria, Queens, right? How do you get Astoria, Queens or Long Island City to give up their, their autonomy? You say, if you, same reason why suburbs, little towns, you know, little suburbs are enveloped into large cities. They say, look, you're going to tap into the big tax base here in the big city. The Wall Street uh, tax base is going to allow Queens to go from being farms to being developed uh, real estate. So I don't know if there's a direct uh, Georgist link behind that, but certainly some of the ideas that are being talked about in that, in making that case for the consolidation, uh, come out of that, or, or, the, or they link up with some of the things that that, uh, that George was was arguing for. Yeah, thanks. This is a terrific presentation. Well, thank you. And I hope you and the Lincoln Institute find a way to give it wide distribution. Because well, I, thank I you. really think it needs to be heard, which leads me to the question: all the political candidates mm -hmm. are talking about inequality, but how do you get them to look at a policy change that would be radically different? And this this kind of thinking does indicate that we need a radically different policy change. 
I hope you're going to send copies of your book to all of those who are talking <laughs> about inequality. I have a list of people I'm going to send it to. I, I, uh, yeah, I'm just not so sure Rand Paul would, um, you know, uh, he would. Might. He might, because Henry George actually, you know, <laughs> You know, and, and that's, it yeah. appeals to some libertarians. Henry George does appeal to some Yeah, and it, but again, like, I, I think, I think it, and this is just me speaking without having, I, I, I'm guessing the libertarian appeal of Henry George is cherry-picking some sentences um, rather than the big picture. I'm, I'm saying that just from my own, because George does, I, I've seen this, on, I've, I found a libertarian site. That was, in fact, I was Googling like Henry George quotes. I was trying to find a particular one, and uh, it, it came across one where it basically George uh, lays out why governments do everything wrong and why individuals, and I, I can't remember what article, it was not the, from the, the, his main, it was not from Progress and Poverty, that's for certain. But, but his, his emphasis on the, what you create with your own hands yep. belong to you. That's a very... That's what it was, that's right, that's yeah, right. Something about the fundamental evil of... of that, you know. that has a libertarian appeal and yeah. the land value tax actually now, you know, and in George's time too, he used land to mean all naturally occurring right. resources. When he wrote, it was the land that was more central, mm. but now we're talking carbon tax and all of those things are actually an application of George's theories, whether they're called that or not. Right. But I, I just want you to, to help figure out a way to get this message to the people who are talking about it. Well, I, I, I thank you for saying that, and I, and I, hope, I hope that I can. You know, um, uh, I'm doing what I can to, um, to get opportunities like this. Um, there's possibility of C-SPAN will film one, film one of these things in the fall. So, um, you know, um, you never know. Just like with Henry George, you know, he, he, he hoped his book would become a big impact uh, bestseller. I, I don't have ambitions in that direction necessarily, just, but I would hope that it would be one that, that would spark that conversation. Well, I, mean, I, I think it may be advantageous that it's taking you this long to write it because this is a very good time to have it. Yeah, I've, it, I've said in, in more offhanded ways, I said, you know, fortunately for me, or the upside of having this agonizing decades-long delay has been that um, George is now relevant, but that's unfortunate for most Americans. I mean, I wish that Henry George had remained, irre not irrelevant, but less relevant, um, and, and the, some of the ways his, his, what, he, what he writes have, uh, feels like you know, something you're reading in a, in a, in, on the Huffington Post or something. Um, so yes, it, George is, um, it, it's, I think the moment is again right for a, a jo revisiting some of what uh, George had to say. And to kind of counter this notion that um, progressive thinking, progressivist ideas broadly understood um, are somehow some radical invention of 1968, you know, uh, which is how often these things are, are termed um, by, by people that are, that are sort of anti-progressive um, or ex extremely conservative. And it's say, no, th there's, a, there's always been this tradition. And there's, again, there's always been this, tr this tradition of uh, the common good, this, this which seems so lefty and so hippy-dippy. It's not. It's really part of the, uh, the, the way the founders and, and people after them, key people after them in generations, have understood uh, how you make a better society and how you adapt a society to, to the appropriate times. So, so thank you. Yep. I, I believe from the little that I've read, I think he was in favor of free trade. That was his other big, big idea. Uh, yep. and I'm just wondering what he would think of today. You know, there's certain pressures, um, automation and globalization on, mm -hmm. on the American labor of today. What would he? What would be some? Did he have any thoughts about what he could do? What we could do to help that situation? Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. You know, to, to in grad school they teach us don't speculate on. You know, um, don't don't get in counterfactual uh, fant fantasizing or thinking. I think George probably, he was a real, tr in the same way he had a real absolute faith in the single tax, just sort of fixing everything. Um, I think he believed uh, that free trade just made sense. It seemed almost ordained, that anything else was sort of an artificial creation of man that, that was sort of counter to the, in the same way that, you know, somehow God had come up with gravity, right? The gravity, you drop, you know, something, that, and that that's a, a law of nature, and that free trade seemed to be kind of in that, in that realm. And I don't think George could have conceived of mechanization doing you know the kinds of things that it that it does now I mean they were people were worried about mechanization in his era uh, and losing jobs and all but there was this there was enough happening uh, for example not sort of just past George's time but you know the one we often cite that the automobile you know eventually wipes out the uh, much of the horse trade much of the horse and b buggy you know manufacturing and repair but it, it undeniably created you know right before our eyes probably ten times as many jobs 
uh, and cleaned up our city streets. It's kind of fun to think about that historically. The automobile was hailed as the environmental savior of the city, <laughs> which it was, short term. <laughs> um, yep. In front. Uh, writers today, like Nick Hanauer, talk a lot about sort of what they, what I guess you would say is uh, the pitchfork theory. The idea that he, he often talks to his fellow plutocrats saying, uh, you know, it, we're headed down this path as well. Mm. If we don't do something about it right now, it's not going to end well for us rich people. Right. And that we ought to get out ahead of that, whether that's through an improvement on wage or various other things. Well, I, think I guess the, the, question, well, the question I have is looking back historically as a historian mm -hmm. 100 years ago, what was it that tipped us from the Gilded Age into the Progressive Age that might be of use today? Well, I think you're, you're right. Part because of it, it was, could have gone the other yeah, way. I mean, one, ended in revolution. It could have. And I think a lot of people, there are people, you know, it's not just Howard Zinn, but many historians have said, you know, the way, what, why when big things happen in this country, it's the fear of violence, right? The Civil Rights Movement wasn't about beautiful, prosaic, amazing speeches on the, at the, on the Washington Mall, at so much as it was people in the streets and, and violent incidents uh, occurring and ultimately, you know, even more, more radical versions of, of Martin Luther King, like uh, the Black Panther Party. And so I think, given those stats I was showing you about, about uh, strikes and so forth, and, and that carries well into the 20th century. There are bombing campaigns by anarchists. There's a lot to be afraid of. And so a lot of people said, you know, we really, much as we'd like to stick by these the market will fix everything. I determine the wages I'm going to pay my workers. I owe my workers nothing but their wages, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of rhetoric just rings hollow and rings, rings, rings irresponsible among uh, wealthy people, among capitalists, among business people saying, uh, if we give up a little bit of our autonomy, a little bit of our wealth, and treat our workers a little bit better, just like John Lincoln, you know, probably part of his calculus was maybe more um, more uh, optimistically or, or philosophically motivated, saying this is the right thing to do. But there are plenty of other, other business Yeah, and there's, there's guys like Henry Ford who say, right, it's in my own economic interest that I have customers, yes. and why not my own workers to be my customers? Yeah. And, um, and that's unfortunate. We're, you know, we're in a situation now, and I, I'm again sort of stepping a little bit out of my zone here, but you know, I, I drove with a, uh, took a car ride with a very powerful CEO um, who's an alum of uh, Holy Cross, and, and he was coming to give a talk. And he said, you know what, CEOs like, like me, and he does not see himself in this mold, but he says, you know what the, um, what's the average CEO does, thinks about on the way to work every day as he's driven to work? And I said, no, and he said, shedding jobs. That's the shedding jobs, shedding, you know, shedding labor as fast as possible, because it's all about shareholder value and my, you know, t t you know the next quarterly statement. Uh, and that's what, it's, uh, that's what it's about. It's not about, and so the shifting, the trying to find a way to shift the focus off of that incredibly narrow-minded, short-term, socially destructive kind of way of thinking. These are not evil people, but they have, uh, the way the, the rules of the game, the way the rules of the market have been established, and the power of investment you know, interest in, in Wall Street. That's what, you know, so, you know, Fidelity just announced that they're uh, laying off 25,000 workers and, uh, you know, you just, you, we've come to hear these things all the time that, uh, t you know, 5,000 stores are going to be closing from such and such retailer and it's because of this incredible pressure. So I don't know, um, this, the hopeful sign is that we're going to have some great experiments happening in this, in our, you know, LA's $15 minimum wage is either going to work uh, or it's going to fail. And there are a lot of people sort of looking at lab these laboratories of experimentation to see that these things can be done. In the same way, now we have to hold our breath on this one, or, but w where do we get this idea, at least to, to a degree, that universal, some, some form of uh, universal health care could work? It started here in Massachusetts, uh, oddly enough, in the Romney administration. And then that, that the success of that model became a way of allowed people to say, it can work if you do it right. It can be a national model. We'll fight about the details and so forth. So there are experiments and, and uh, hopeful signs that, that some sort of return, turn away from that kind of narrow-minded thinking are, are happening. Yeah, he, Nick Hanauer is a good, a good modern reference for me because mm. he, one of the first things he wrote about was the idea that, that we have this traditional model of the economy as a machine. Mm. And when you're operating a machine, the idea is keep your hands off it. Let it operate right. the way it's supposed to operate. Don't monk it up. Mm -hmm. And he says a better analogy for a modern economy is a garden, where you actually have to tend it. You mm -hmm. actually have to get involved as a government to enable various things to grow, yep. or else they don't. 
And I would say, George would say, absolutely. And he would say, he, George is very fond of talking about interdependence. You know, like I said, the old way, and we all lived on small farms and small workshops, these things, these, these new old ways of thinking made sense. But now we are just so tied to each other. And he was saying this 150 years ago. We are so tied to each other. So our interests, our, our lives, our everything are so tied that uh, we do have to have something. That, that metaphor really does sort of, I think, capture that idea. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the extensions of uh, George's ideas on, in, in the form of value capture. And this notion that, um, well, this, the single tax on the land value tax itself is a hard sell, as you know. Yes. But at the margin, it's becoming very popular, particularly in Latin America and many other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. where basically what you're doing is the land value increment that is generated by, by external factors. Um, particularly the government intervention mm -hmm. should be recovered for the benefit of the community. And this is becoming part of, of national legislation in many countries. Uh, and there, there are some countries that are actually being implemented with some, with some teeth there. As, uh, in some places there is actually generating quite a bit of money. Yeah, and I think, and there's a, some data on that. The, you know, again, I'm treading out of my history, my history shoes, and into the economist world. But um, and finding ways to, you know, the, the I don't know, I'm going to mispronounce the term, but the, what I think of as a two-tiered system or a two the split uh, property tax, where you pro you tax property and then you tax buildings uh, separately, which seems to be sort of a, a, a halfway measure to sort of show. And there's apparently data that shows. It's more radical by what I'm saying now, because this is this is actually getting the up to 100% of the land value increment that is generated by a change in, in zoning or FARs or mm -hmm. stuff like that, that oh. should be recovered and it actually being, being done already. Yeah, I guess I would, with that, that's this is him and George at the margin. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where, you know, you do see the possibility of, of uh, some of these um, ideas, specifically something like the single tax, or at least a tax based on that land value uh, um, idea that, that that can be something that, that takes hold and um, again I don't I can't I don't always understand what Stiglitz writes about but apparently he was he's written recently about um, that this in the vein of Piketty saying this global problem of inequality not just individuals getting really rich and lots of people getting poor but you know parts of the globe getting extremely uh, wealthy and other parts not so that the focus needs to be on land and housing and so if it's the economist is going that way. Yeah. Right, recently. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's interesting interesting to see. I mean, sometimes I I give this presentation and I I become increasingly depressed as I go through it. And sometimes I I I think I pick up on things that are happening. And you know, I have four children, so I have to be an optimist on some to, some level just to sort of keep my keep my saying. They're not children anymore. The youngest just turned twenty today. I have four girls, twenty to twenty five years old. So um, sort of hoping the. Uh, Hoping the, the Republic gets back on track uh, in the next uh, few generations. In the same line about uh, Stiglitz, you mentioned uh, Piketty. Well, Stiglitz, of course, wrote a, wrote a book recently on the same theme. Of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but he's also the author of the, of the Henry George Theorem, which is the, the link. He basically put the Henry, Henry George Theorem in the modern urban economics. Mm -hmm. That's another link, I think. It, uh, maybe more more direct than uh, than Piketty. Yeah, I think so because uh, Piketty certainly has a presence here in the United States, but Stiglitz, I think, has a much more firm presence. And he, you know, has the you know the outlet of the New York Times. Um, I did. I sent I sent him a book. So <laughs> we'll see. D did you have a question? Yeah, I just wondered if you could talk about uh, the personal experiences that made Henry George think about. Uh, the wealth and land, mm. and uh, about urban development, and, and of course, at the time, um, the railroads had so, so much to do with mm. um, the prosperity of the country. Um, but as we think about cities here at the Lincoln Institute, I mm. just wondered if he had some sort of eye-opening experiences that led him to think about land and urban development. Yeah, he did. He had two kind of visions. Literally, he says, "I stood there, and suddenly, you know, I could see things." Very biblical uh, in its description. They were both 1869, 1870. Uh, one of them was in New York City. The first time he visited New York City and he stood there and just saw the, the splendor of Fifth Avenue and the squalor of Five Points, which is the, you know, the, the slum downtown. And he said, there and then I made a vow that I was going to find a way to, to resolve this, the, this dilemma. So um, it was very vivid. And either just before that or just after that, 
he was out of uh, San Francisco in the hills uh, outside of uh, San Francisco in the, in the country. And he was looking at all this beautiful farmland that was not being used. And he passed a, a guy on a horse and said, hey, who owns, you know, who owns all this land? And I can't remember exactly what the guy said, but the guy said, oh yeah, this land is phenomenally valuable. You know, like, it's $100 an acre or something like that. And he, again, it was like a bolt of lightning. He said, wait a minute, $100 an acre, it's, it's valuable, but it's being held idle. And that was where speculation, kind of the, the kind of negative impact of hoarding land, just waiting to flip it, not using, and, and thereby keeping it out of the hands of hundreds, maybe thousands of, of uh, real people, you know, real workers, people that would put it, uh, put it to good use. And of course, in California, where George was, uh, the railroads are powerful everywhere. They're no more, there's no place on the earth where the railroads are more powerful and more dominant in the state legislature than California. So his, uh, his encounters with corporate, corporate power are very, probably extra vivid in California than they are um, uh, for, for other people in other, in other contexts. So th I think those are some of the uh, experiences that he has that uh, kind of feed his imagination and, and feed that sense of, of mission, you know, that sense of... Uh, I've got to do something about this. I better start reading economics. You know, <laughs> it's really an amazing, an amazing story. Yep. Uh, does he also? I mean, I, I've only read the parts that where he talks about the land tax. Does he also talk about the other ways that corporations are taking money, including get, getting more of the, the rent of the of the of the workers' labor? I mean, is he is, is he interested in? Well, he does. He, I mean, he speaks again in very, very broad strokes. So he keeps talking in very vivid passages about workers who are just, you know, being ground down and, and uh, not. Although they're working, although they're hardworking, they're less and less. But he doesn't attribute it to, you know, a cruel capitalist per se. He says it's part of. It's a much, much larger macro level uh, problem. And in fact, he says, uh, what makes a capitalist cruel, who slashes wages and things, is not necessarily his cold heart. It's the fact that this kind of dog-eat-dog, -dog, ultra hyper-individualist society, this kind of society turns good people desperate and makes everybody terrified. And so everybody grabs as much as they can. And again, this is the opposite of community, right? He says, where if we could just you know, get our soul back here, and we, or, or, we've, we're losing our soul because everybody's terrified of falling. Individuals are terrified of plunging into the, into the working class. Middle class people are terrified of plunging into the working class. And so what this brings out the worst in people. And people say, look, I, gotta, I, don't, I, don't have to, I can't, I, I feel for the other people, but I can't worry about that. I've got to keep my business afloat. I have to do what I have to do. So he speaks in those kinds of terms about, why, about the plight of the American uh, worker. Um. Henry George wrote about inequality, the crisis of inequality, in a time when I'm going to guess the total tax burden on income and wealth was probably in single digits. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we've got the, the similar crisis of inequality when the total tax burden on income and wealth is probably well up in the 40s when you tally it all up. And the social, on the social safety net is maybe between a trillion and a trillion and a half a year. Did, mm. did he advocate? other than land taxation, any kind of wealth transfer, entitlement, uh, the kinds of things that we have quite a bit of today? He, uh, he in, a, in a sense he did, but very impressionistically, very poetically, you know, very uh, utopian-esque. So he said, if you adopt this, uh, abolish all other taxes, most of which are regressive and, and, danger, and damaging to the economy, and impose just a single tax, the revenue generated from that will allow local governments, state governments to do what they, to, to build beautiful parks and schools, to have beautiful streets. And so he, the last couple chapters of the book, it's not an entitlement program, but it's basically saying this will op create an opportunity. There'll be so much public revenue that, you know, we will have beautiful streets, beautiful, everyone will have excellent housing, everyone will have uh, comforts, there'll be, you know, lyceums for learning. And, and uh, ed so he, he paints this beautiful picture, but it's not a, uh, what, what you're talking about in a, more, in a more modern sense, where these things are going to be provided through programs uh, and there's wealth transfer. I mean, he, he's, that was the, the allure, and I think in some ways the, the problem of the single tax was that it was, it was so, to him, so self-evident that it was, you know, you impose this one tax, um, how are you going to collect the taxes? He never said. How are you going to, you know, what kind of formula you're going to use to evaluate? Never, never really got into that. Um, but he was, but in his mind, he was thinking along the lines of providing for for, for the needy people. But he wasn't. He didn't see any problems, potential problems, with a with a, 
Um, well, another way to look at it is he, um, he said, he, he fashioned himself as a Jeffersonian. So he, even though he talked about using state power in a way that would never be been used before, he always says, but I'm a small government guy, you know? And so he said, the single tax, the beauty of it is it gets rid of all these other taxes and it's gonna create a utopian society where we won't need jails anymore. So there's a part of the government that does, you know, d practically disappears. We won't need nearly as many courts because the, um, we won't be you know, fighting with each other and, and there won't be as nearly as much crime. We won't need nearly as big an army. We won't need, so he, he is able to invoke government power as a way to reduce uh, the power of the government. So I don't know if that's, it's not really an answer, a direct answer, but it's sort of telling you the parts of, the parts of that uh, answer that I, can, that I can give, yeah. Yep. Um, how many places did people actually try to do the single tax? I'm a title examiner, mm -hmm. and I have found in western Middlesex County and eastern North, uh, Worcester County, mm -hmm. there, there were these single tax enclaves where they actually did this stuff. Mm-hmm. Probably in the 19 teens or yeah, yeah. it was you know a while back and, and there were lots of these places probably some places that, that there are no records for other than the ones buried in in in, in evidence like that but there are other other places like, you know Pennsylvania for example is probably the best the, the one state where more towns have adopted at least something along the lines uh, of a land value based uh, tax system and there are there are colonies too like Fairhope uh, Alabama is a is a, a, a town that is still I think. Corporate, corporately owned and all, and uh, they were established explicitly as a Georgist colony. So there are, there are a couple of examples, one in New Jersey, this name escapes me. Um, so there have been a few full-on larger Georgist communities, and then a, a lot of places where it's been adopted, at least in some partial measure. Um, I've been reading a book um, about slavery and the creation of American capitalism, mm. talking about um, how cotton, which was the, the source of wealth of its day, yeah. worldwide, um, and the, the system of torture that was used to make slaves work so efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder if, if any of that, that was a little before his time, but he was alive then for, for the end of it. Um, did that have any effect on his thinking? Well, the, the times where he talks about slavery, I mean, he uses, he talks about American workers. He says, this direction we're going in, we're creating industrial slaves. And so he uses, you know, very radical statements. He says, we are here to abolish industrial slavery. But when talking about slaves, African Americans who were enslaved, you know, it, most, he becomes, um, starts to get his feet under himself after the Civil War. Um, but he often, he's frequently will cite the problem of land monopoly and, and, and restricted access to land. He said, we got it half right. In the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War. We gave former slaves their freedom and then we gave them no land. And who got the land? All the former Confederates, all the former plantation owners, and guess what? They've now been able to stick these people back into not slavery but something very close to it. Because if you don't have land, you are powerless, you are high, it's the ultimate exploitable uh, individual. So he, he cites not in that kind of global perspective. In fact, I don't think anybody, it's only in recent times we really stopped to think about how cotton was this one incredibly transformative thing that, that uh, had shaped the world in a lot of ways. The, the, the figures that this guy cites in, this, in his book about um, increases in productivity um, brought about by torture mm -hmm. uh, because that was how you got people to pick more. Yeah, compelling people, you know, uh, um, that's what it's all about. You know, we have a lot of, uh, it's a whole other, <laughs> we a whole other topic, but we have very strange and um, ill-formed notions of what slavery was really all about. Um, and not just here in the United States, but um, uh, globally. You know, when you look at the statistics, not with cotton, but with sugar, you know, the average enslaved person in a, a sugar island lived like 18 months. Because the, because the, the, the profits were so staggering. That would not happen in Alabama, right? Because the, the economics were different. It was in your interest to keep your enslaved people uh, alive. But in the, cotton, in the sugar islands, just literally disposable labor. And so, the, you know, you don't talk about the market. The market dictated that that was, that that was okay. And that uh, you could buy, the, buy, the, buy people cheaply and burn them out and in, in kill them in a year and a half. And 
still have, you know, make so much money on their productive labor that you would be able to buy more. So uh, I think there's an urban industrial version of that at this time, which is there's always another guy willing to take your job. Right. You know, yeah. So it's, it's not a torture as much as a, just this generalized anxiety that your life could change dramatically at any moment if you don't get along. Right, raw, you know, raw exploitation, and that means that you know that joining a union can often be extremely a, a good idea because we could have a little bit of influence against our employer, or against you know. But if you join a union, there are no rules, no laws saying you can't fire. So you get, so you you it, that that kind of coercive power um, is has many many manifestations, other, not just how many hours you're going to work and how many what your wages are going to be. So. The book is Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality. Please join me in thanking Edward O'Donnell.